Matthew chapter 26 is one spot. John chapter 12 is he another one. And the interesting thing about this story is that it's one of the few stories in the Bible that is mentioned in all the Gospel accounts. Uh, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. All right, and uh, I'll get you the one in Mark in a minute. Uh, but for right now, turn over to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Uh, so interesting is this subject that I'm going to be talking about it tonight from another angle. I'm going to be talking about Mary and Martha this morning from an analytical angle. And tonight, from a practical angle. You know, everything seemed to go wrong the day that Jesus came into the home of Mary and Martha. To the point where Martha started rebuking Jesus, got mad at her sister. And it got me to thinking about the fact that, uh, what if Jesus came over our house? Would, would we be scrambling for the remote control? Would we have to stick our cigarette between the, the couch cushions, see some smoke coming up there? Would we be running around trying to get the right clothes on or clean everything up? Or, or would we just say, oh, Jesus, you're just in time for supper. Come on in. Everything would just fall into place. Something to think about. Well, Jesus is a guest in our lives. In uh, Revelation 3.20, the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's Jesus talking. If any man opens the door, I will come in unto him. So tonight I'm going to be talking about overcoming obstacles that keeps us from entertaining Jesus. This morning we're going to look at it from a different angle. Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 38. You can turn it down a little bit, Josh. I don't want to blow everybody out of their socks. Uh, Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 38. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which, was, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was covered about much service. And came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. In this story of Mary and Martha, so often Martha's given a bad rap. I've done it myself. Martha is considered the bad guy in the story. But that's not necessarily true. They both went on the amount of light that they were given. And that's all any of us can do. I look back at some of the things I believed, some of the things that I said years ago. I was going on the light that I was given, but when God gives you more light, sometimes you, you change your way of thinking. The truth of the matter is they were both serving the Lord. And they both sought to meet the, the needs of the Lord Jesus. They were just wired. And you're going to see that in families. There might be a, a family member that's just outgoing and bubbly and a real people person. And then there might be another family member that kind of keeps to himself, is reflective, quiet. Neither one of them is wrong. It's just how they're wired. That's one of the dynamics of church. As the church begins to grow, God's going to send all kinds of people our way. Happy people, sad people, positive people, negative people, saved people, unsaved people, all wired different. And we've got to love them where they're at. We've got to accept them with the light that they've been given and work with them where they're at. That's what Jesus did. Just something to think about. They were both serving the Lord, and they both sought to meet the needs of the Lord, but in different ways. Jesus took on the likeness of mankind. He took upon himself human flesh. And though he was God in the flesh, he felt all the things that we felt. He got hungry. No doubt about it. Supper time came. Jesus was looking for a meal. He got tired, physically tired. He knows when we're wore out because he's been there. He got sad. He shed tears. Shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. 
He loved others. He knew the pain of being betrayed and rejected. Martha was a doer. She was a go-getter. Maybe even a little bit of a control freak. Maybe. But she liked getting things done and she wanted everything to be special when Jesus came to her home. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, sometimes folks really don't, don't care what their home looks like. We were talking about a neighbor I used to know. They had a couple of dogs. And that pile of dog stuff would sit there until it would hard. And I'd be looking at it like, and they'd be just walking over it, just like, just don't, don't mind that, just step around it. So, okay. But that's just how people are different that way. If I knew that I was going to have Jesus over or one of you over, I would just want everything to be nice. Everything to be special. And that seems to be how Martha's wired here. Martha knew how to get things done. She knew how to take care of business. And that's a good quality. Here's the thing. And I never saw this before. Martha appealed to the physical needs of Jesus. The needs of Jesus' humanity. She appealed to that side. She knew the Lord probably wasn't eating a whole lot of good meals, maybe a little bit of bread, a little bit of honey. I bet you she fixed a meal fit for a cake. Brought out the good silverware. You know what that's like. Growing up, my mom, we, she used to sweep the yard. I used to tell her, Mom, there ain't nothing but dirt out there. It didn't matter. She was out there sweeping the yard. Company was coming over. Get out the good silverware. Put away the paper plates. I believe that's just what Martha did. She had she appealed to Jesus' as humanity. Where Mary appealed, appealed to Jesus' as divinity. She was coming before Him, worshiping Him as God. She was worshiping as the Lord. Both women had a ministry to Jesus. Both were important to Jesus. And both met separate needs of the Lord. Now Sunday, this past Sunday, I mentioned that the story of the woman of the city, the harlot that came to the house of Simon the Pharisee, where Jesus was eaten, she anointed him with precious ointment and washed his feet with her tears. I mentioned that Sunday that, that when Jesus is in the house, sometimes folks don't even know him. that Pharisee was a religious ruler. God was in the house and he didn't even know it. He even got on to say that if, if Jesus really was not a prophet, he would know what manner of woman. You remember when I mentioned that? God in the house. God showed me something. And I, if I'm wrong, show me if I'm wrong. But if I'm right, then we're on to something real powerful here. I just couldn't wait to share this with you. This woman had just recently been saved. This woman that washed Jesus' feet with her tears and anointed him. She had recently come to know God. And it's possible that this sudden transformation was so new, so recent, that she still wore the makeup of her old life. Maybe still wore the clothes of her old life. Outwardly, she still looked the same. But on the inside, a whole lot of change had taken place. And that's what this self-righteous Pharisee was seeing, her outward appearance. Turn over to Luke chapter 7. This is all going to tie in together here. Luke chapter 7. Beginning with verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, believed to be a nice way of saying she was a harlot. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Alright, we'll stop right there. So there it is. She probably still looked like a sinner. Probably had the makeup of a sinner, and I'm using that term for what they were judging her about. But she, her heart was right with God. That's the part that the Pharisee couldn't see. 
He had no idea of the transformation that had taken place inside of her. This Pharisee treated this woman with disdain and he treated Jesus the same way. She's got no business being in here, this dirty woman. And this fellow over here, this supposed prophet, he's letting her do all this. If he was a real prophet, he wouldn't. The thing is, Jesus did know who she was and what she used to be. He did know because he was God. And as stated earlier, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. That's the difference. You can only go on what you see. So many times judgment is made by what we see on the outside. But God wants us to look at the person's heart because that's what God sees. The point of the whole story was the fact that this Pharisee, this religious leader, was lifting himself up because of his outward appearance. Beautiful flowing robes, immaculate beard, fingernails done exactly right, gold rings and bracelets. Outwardly he looked real religious. And he lifted himself up because of the way he looked. Completely unaware that he himself was empty inside. He was empty. While this woman may not have looked right, she had not had a chance to distance herself from her old life. But I'm telling you right now, her heart was right with God. She was pouring out her heart before God. She was saved. She was born again. She had been given new life in Christ. And there's no doubt in my mind that in time, this woman would also be transformed outwardly. But it's a process that takes time. It's not an overnight kind of change outwardly. Sometimes folks will get saved and have a scruffy beard and wild-looking hair and wild-looking clothes. They're just babes in Christ. Maybe a week later, a month later, a year later, five years later, they look like a different person. I was kidding with Dan. He came in the other day. I said, you got a brother who was coming out of this church? He looked like a different person. And I love him just either way. It don't matter to me, but he just looked, he looked sharp. And I was just kidding with him a little bit. That he looks nice. God's doing something in his heart. Amen. And it's being reflected out. Hallelujah. It was going to take some time to replace her wardrobe. To get some modest apparel that would glorify God. She was wearing probably all that she had. Old habits die hard. It would take time to recognize the fact that she didn't need a ton of makeup and perfume to be attractive, that she was beautiful just the way she was in the eyes of God. Amen. Incidentally, this harlot, this woman of the city, I believe it was Mary, Martha's sister, who sat at Jesus' feet. This is going to blow you away, because it blew me away. I couldn't wait to share this with you. I'm going to make a claim right here that this woman of the city who was called a woman of the city, a sinner, a harlot, I believe it was Mary. And I'm going to try to prove it to you. Now, we just looked at our passage in Luke. Turn over to John chapter 11 first. John chapter 11. We're going to start. Do you like those, do you like those uh, CSI kind of programs where, you, where they, they try to put together what happened at the crime scene? I like them too. I like a good mystery. What's that game we used to play when we were kids with Professor Mustard? Clue? That's a fun game. Professor Mustard, was that his name? Colonel Mustard? Professor Yeah, you got it. Killed him with a candlestick in the uh, dining room. Well, that's what we're going to do here. We're going to put together the pieces and see if we can figure something out here. John chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Now notice the similarity of these passages. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment. Whoa, whoa, wait a second here. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. One of two possibilities. Either Jesus got anointed twice, which really doesn't seem likely. That ointment was pungent. It was strong. It was expensive. It's very possible that he got anointed twice before he died. I don't think so, which would mean one thing. Same story. Okay, hold your place right there. Now turn over to, to uh, chapter Luke chapter 12.
No, correct me. John chapter 12. I'm sorry. I had, I had it written as John and I said uh, John chapter 12. Here is another passage that speaks about the same incident. John 12, 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment. Whoa, wait a second. Another passage talking about Mary with ointment. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now we know that two of those accounts line up, both John chapter 12 and Luke chapter 11. Talk about the talk, Luke chapter um, 11. Talk about the fact that Mary was doing the anointing. Now this will really blow your minds. I believe this Pharisee, where Jesus was eating, whose name was Simon, Simon the Pharisee, according to Luke chapter 7, it gives his name in Luke 7:40. And in Luke 7.43 and in Luke 7.44, three times, the Pharisee in our opening passage, his name is Simon. Let's just look at one of them, just, just for argument's sake. Uh, Luke 7.40. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, there it is, I have somewhat to say unto thee. Verse 43, Simon answered. Verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon. So we've established the fact that the name of this fellow was Simon the Pharisee. Okay, that's important. I believe that this Pharisee may have been Judas Iscariot's father. Oh, come on now. you got to be pulling my leg. Why do I say that? Okay, we're going to turn some more pages. Turn over to John chapter 6. I don't know how you feel about it, but I find this stuff is just it's fascinating. Even if it's just a theory, it's an interesting theory. Could that Pharisee be Judas' father? Let's do some detective work. John 6, chapter 30. Uh, John 6, verse 30. Verse 70. John 6, 70. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of who? Uh, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Well, that's pretty interesting right there. It's a little passage that you would overlook. We know that Judas' father, his name was Simon. Now, it was a fairly common name, Simon Peter, Simon the Sorcerer. It was a fairly common name, but, but we're fine-tuned in this matter. Here in this passage of Scripture, we are told that Judas Iscariot was the son of someone named Simon. Okay, now flip over to John chapter 12. Beginning with verse 1. John 12, 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him supper. Martha served, Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. That's where we left off. Now look at the next verse. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, what? Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. I think it's kind of interesting that in the same passage where this incident takes place, it mentions the fact of Simon's son. Could it be a connection since it was Simon's house that he said this to Simon's son said this? We're going to find out. So here again, Judas Iscariot is referred to as Simon's son. Let me give you one more. John chapter 13. I never saw this. Verse 1 and 2. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. 
Drop down to verse 26. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. This is the third time where we're told that Judas was the son of a fellow named Simon. Listen, when the Bible repeats some information, it's because God's trying to show us something. When he does it three times, he's waving a flag saying, hey, over here. Here's where things get real interesting. We are told something else about this fellow, Simon the Pharisee. We are given some additional information about Simon the Pharisee, and it's the fact that this guy was a leper. He was leprous. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Where do you get that from? Matthew chapter 26. See, that's why you need these little paint markers. Yeah. Matthew 26. The guy had leprosy. This Pharisee, this religious ruler, had leprosy. Matthew 26 and verse 6. Again, parallel passages of the same story. Matthew 26, 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon, not Simon the Pharisee, but now he's being referred to as Simon the leper. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. Same story. No name is given on the woman. We're just giving the additional information that this Pharisee, Simon, was leprous. If you know anything about leprosy, it was one of the most dreaded diseases. Your body parts would slowly start to fall off. Fingers, nose, your ears, and your body would literally just rot away. It was a horrible disease. Let me give you one more. Mark chapter 14. And this is the other passage where it talks about the incident. Mark chapter 14. It's good to shake the dust off these Bibles. Amen? Amen. Mark 14, 1. After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by crab and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany, there it is again, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. We are not given any details about his situation. Two things are possible. Number one, his leprosy was probably in the early stages which was probably why he was still uh, carrying himself in, some, in such a self-righteous way. He probably still looked all right. It hadn't spread yet. That's why this guy was carrying himself with such self-righteous dignity. He probably didn't look that bad. Check with this guy in the latter stages, and I don't think he'd be singing such a happy tune. So I believe that when the, he got this leprosy, it probably was recent. Number two, I don't believe Jesus healed this guy. That's, that's the second thing I don't believe. I don't think Jesus healed him. The scriptures refer to him as Simon the leper as a current thing, not Simon who used to be the leper. Oftentimes when someone was different, Rahab the harlot, that she used to be the harlot, I think he was still a leper, which means Jesus hadn't healed this guy, and there's nowhere in the Bible where it's mentioned that Jesus healed this guy. The other reason why I believe this guy was still a leper was the fact that there's no attitude of reverence or thanks towards Jesus. If Jesus had healed this guy of his leprosy, he would have been singing a different tune. He would have been doing the same thing that woman of the city was doing. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for healing me. Oh, dear God, thank you for your hand of healing. I mean, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He didn't believe that Jesus was a prophet. So how could he possibly have been healed? If Jesus healed this guy of his leprosy, his whole attitude would have been different towards Jesus. Amen? Amen. You still with me? Yep. So, what have we established so far? Number one, the Pharisee, in whose house Jesus was eaten, his name was Simon, he was a Pharisee, and he had leprosy. We all agree on that. That's pretty clear, right? right. Number two, that Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus was the son of someone named Simon. 
Could it be just a coincidence, or there could be more to it. Number three, each of the Gospels mentions a woman with an alabaster box of ointment anointing Jesus before his death. Matthew 26 mentions it, Mark 14, Luke chapter 7, and John chapter 12 all mention a woman with a box of ointment anointing Jesus. Two separate occasions? Could be, but there may be more to it. Only one account mentions a woman's name. John chapter 12 mentions Mary, sister to Martha and Lazarus, as anointing Jesus with this ointment, which leaves one of two possibilities. Number one, either Jesus was anointed on two separate occasions, which seems highly unlikely, or the woman of the city, the harlot that came to the Pharisee's house, was in fact Mary. Which would greatly explain why she was worshiping the Lord with such reverence. Through salvation, she had been delivered from the bondage of immorality. She was living a wicked life, evidently. No wonder Mary didn't want to do anything but sit at the feet of Jesus. She had been clean. She had been restored. She had been given a second chance through salvation. She had been set free from the bondage that sin had her in. And I have to believe that this second possibility is the right one. That Mary was the woman of the city mentioned in the other accounts. Now if your minds aren't completely blown at this point, let me go a little deeper. Where did Simon the leper, Simon the Pharisee live? Where was his home? Do you remember? Bethany. Huh? Bethany. Really? That's interesting. Uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 3. But let's just make sure. Mark 14, 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Okay, you're right. You guys are right. Simon the Pharisee, Simon the leper, his home was in Bethany. Can we confirm that again? Uh, Mark chapter 26. It's a little bit of a different message. Normally I'm just spitting in fire and brimstone, but uh, I believe sometimes it's good just to break the word down here. Matthew 26, 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, okay, we confirmed it. Is there anyone else that we know that lived in Bethany? Anyone? Yeah. John chapter 11. Let's take a quick look. This is deep. We're going deep today. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of where? Bethany. The town of Mary and her sister Martha. They could have been neighbors. I won't rule out that possibility that maybe they were just neighbors, next door neighbors or something, but maybe there was something more at work. Here in this passage of Scripture, we are told that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus also lived in Bethany. Coincidence? Maybe. Maybe not. And explain, if you will, what we're told in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Explain this to me. John 12, 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, there they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. The indication seems to be that Simon the Pharisee, Simon the leper, who lived in Bethany, whose home Jesus was visiting to eat a meal, the indication seems to be that he may have been the father of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Sorry. Why else would he be in Bethany, in a home, when this woman came in to anoint Jesus? It would explain why he didn't throw out this woman in the city, which was normal procedure. If a harlot walked into someone's house where she didn't belong, she wouldn't have gotten past the doorway. They would say, yeah, yo, get out of here. You don't belong here. we got a guest of honor here. Okay. Why was this woman walking? I always wonder, why did she just come strolling into this Pharisee's house and he didn't try to stop her? He didn't throw her out because this harlot was his daughter, Mary, who lived there. Now, if you can accept that premise, it would greatly help to explain why Martha was upset when her sister Mary in an earlier incident that we looked at, why she was upset with her. Now, I can't prove this, but it's just a theory. 
it's possible that Martha, who was the daughter of this Pharisee also, Simon the Pharisee, it's possible that she was living a clean life, that she was following the Pharisee vows, that she was living a real clean life. It seems to be the indication. Put another way, she was viewed as the good daughter, the upright, righteous daughter, who kept the commandments and obeyed her father and kept the house nice, while Mary was running with the wrong crowd, living a wicked and moral life, and was probably never home. And I'm going to tell you this. What got me to think about this whole thing is I had read the story of the prodigal son. And if you replace the prodigal son with, with women, the brother that was self-righteous and the one that was wayward, I said, man, that sounds like the story of Martha and Mary. I got to thinking about that. When the prodigal son was turned home, the brother said, oh, you never threw me a feast. He was righteous. In his, he, wouldn't, he wasn't happy that his wayward brother was home. And I got to thinking, man, that sounds like this story. And God started putting it together in my mind. Mary was running with the wrong crowd, running the streets, living a wicked and moral life, was probably never home. But then something wonderful happened. While in her darkest hour, she got gloriously saved. Amen. Her sins were forgiven, and she gave her life to God. My gut feeling is she got saved right around the first time Jesus visited that home. Luke chapter 7, right around that time, I just got a feeling it was so brand new her, that she was literally following Jesus, holding on to him. Tell me more, Lord. Tell me more about this wonderful salvation. Which is why there may have been tension in the air. Martha, the good daughter, the clean living daughter, was upset that she was doing all the work. Probably had been working for days. Mary just comes into the house. Oh, it's about time you showed up. Where have you been? And then sits at the feet of Jesus. Her sister, Mary the harlot, Mary the dirty girl, the bad child wasn't doing anything, wasn't helping her at all. Now get this. Martha went to Jesus and complained about the situation. We looked at it last week. God was in the house and she was talking to him like she was talking to nobody. Aren't you going to say something? You see, she's not helping me. I'm working all alone here. Do something about it, Jesus. That was Martha's attitude. Have you ever heard the expression, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? I think that's what's going on here. Martha was a believer, as was Mary and Lazarus, brothers and sisters. But if Martha was the daughter of Simon the Pharisee of Bethany, she was a lot like her father, who didn't extend Jesus any common courtesies. When Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus into his home, listen to what we're told. Jesus said to Simon, i got something to say to thee. And he said, say on, Master. And in verse 44, he turned to the woman and said, Seest thou this woman? I entered into your house. He didn't give me no water for my feet, but she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman since the time I came in has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. They had the same kind of attitude. This guy didn't show Jesus any courtesy. And when Martha went to Jesus, she had an attitude. I don't know how any way you can look at it, but she had a chip on her shoulder, an axe to grind with Jesus. Martha is treating Jesus with that same disdain. There's no love in her words, but an attitude. And she has a real problem with her sister, and so did the father. In Luke chapter 7, he doesn't even mention his own daughter by name. Luke 7, 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she's a sinner. He was talking about his own daughter. Wouldn't even mention her by name. That's why it seems like well, something's missing. I'm missing something here. In both situations, I believe they were expecting Jesus to take their side. When Martha went to Jesus and said, are you going to do something about my sister? Her? She was expecting Jesus to say, yeah, I'll say something to her right now. When Martha complained to Jesus about her sister and demanded that he step to her, rebuke her, it blew her mind that instead of rebuking Mary, the bad sister, he rebuked Martha, the clean living daughter, and commended Mary in a powerful way saying, she's chose the better thing. 
There's only one thing that's needful, Martha, and she's chosen it. I bet you that didn't go over too well. We're going to look at that tonight. What happened after Jesus left? Same with the Father, Simon the Pharisee. The Pharisees were so self-righteous, so religious, that they wouldn't have anything to do with those they considered unclean. They wouldn't come near them. And this is clearly seen in Matthew chapter 9. You don't have to turn there, but listen to this. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I'll have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not called to call, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Pharisees tried to put Jesus down for breaking bread to sinners. Tried to turn his disciples against him by complaining. He's eating with harlots and publicans. And the disciples, being good Jews, they probably couldn't understand what Jesus said. Yeah, we know. He's in there eating there with Matthew the tax collector. They probably didn't really understand it yet either. I know that for a fact because in John chapter 4, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, who was also a harlot, who was also a Samaritan that was considered a mongrel Jew. When his disciples showed up, they were shocked that Jesus was talking to her because it just wasn't done. Now I mentioned all that because Simon the Pharisee was waiting and watching how Jesus would react when his daughter, Mary, a harlot, began to anoint him and wash his feet with her tears. He was expecting Jesus to say, oh, yo, 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 don't touch me. You're unclean, you're filthy. That's what he was expecting. In his mind, he's thinking, if this guy really is a prophet, he's going to get out of here so fast when he, when he sees my daughter come in here. The Pharisees would have yelled out, I'm clean, unclean, get away from me, don't touch me. Whether it's a leper or, or, or some unclean person, they would yell out, come no further. Jesus didn't do that. Like his daughter Martha, this Pharisee was expecting Jesus to rebuke Mary, but instead he rebukes her father, Simon the Pharisee for his behavior, and again greatly commends the bad daughter, Mary. Both situations, Mary is commended because she chose the right thing. She did the right thing. And again, I don't think it went over too well in that household. Needless to say, Jesus' reaction didn't go over very well in that home between Martha and her dad. And they probably weren't too happy with Mary, who Jesus had commended. Her life had changed. They didn't see that yet. She'd been transformed, given a fresh start and a new beginning. But all they saw was the old man. And maybe some of you ran into that when you got saved. Maybe your old buddy said, oh, he looks like the same old fellow to me. Maybe your family even said, oh, well, let's see how long this lasts. One interesting side note is the fact that Lazarus, the brother, doesn't get caught up in this nonsense. Nowhere do you read about Lazarus saying, hey, yeah, I know, Mary, right? He doesn't get caught up in it. And the only explanation I have is if you if you died and woke up wrapped up like a mummy in a tomb with dead people all around you, uh, and then all of a sudden you were risen from the dead, I believe it would have a change in your attitude. You'd have a whole new outlook on life after something like that happened. Because that's what happened to him. Lazarus died. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. They unwrapped him like a mummy. I'll tell you what, you talk about having a change of attitude. Okay, one more possibility that's going to blow your mind, and I'm just about done. As stated earlier, this Pharisee's name was Simon, Simon the leper, Simon the Pharisee. We're also told that Judas Iscariot was the son of someone named Simon. Coincidence? Maybe. But what if it's not a coincidence? What if Judas Iscariot was also a brother of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? I'm thinking older brother that already left the home where they were still living at home. Some might say, then why wasn't he addressed that way as their brother? How come they didn't refer to us, our brother Judas, just like it says our brother Lazarus? Because he was a traitor. And that changed everything. In the scriptures, when someone did something really bad, that person's name wasn't even mentioned. Which was certainly the case with the woman of the city that anointed Jesus. Three of the Gospels don't even mention her name. 
The father wouldn't even mention her name. In the Middle East, parents would often say, my child is dead. Or, I don't have a son. I don't have a daughter. If they did something to bring shame on the family. In Muslim countries, when someone becomes a Christian, they'll hold a funeral and say, my son is dead. My son is dead to me. So that's what might be going on here concerning Judas. Jesus himself declared in Matthew 26, 24, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Jesus didn't mention by name, but everybody knows who he's talking about, Judas. Again, I can't prove this. It's just an interesting premise. If Judas's father was Simon the Pharisee, that would definitely have caused him caused some trouble between him and Judas when he became an apostle, a disciple of Christ. The Pharisees hated Jesus, sought opportunities to kill Jesus. And then he finds out that his son Judas, Judas Iscariot, who was going to be a Pharisee of Pharisees, just like his dad, was now an apostle, a follower of Jesus. Follow this. The Pharisees had already proclaimed that if anyone was a follower of Christ, they would be kicked out of the temple, banished from the Jewish faith, and considered an outcast. Where do you got that from? John 9, John chapter 9, verse 18. Talking about the fellow that Jesus healed. John 9, 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that he had received sight. And they asked the parents, they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, uh, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Verse 22, here it is. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Wow. What I'm saying is, it's very possible that there was bad blood between Judas and his father Simon because he was a disciple of Jesus and not following the traditions of the Pharisees. And the irony of it is, Judas himself was an unbeliever. That's the irony of it. Now this is where it gets completely crazy and I'm done. Simon the Pharisee seems to have renounced his daughter Mary, number one, for her wicked and moral life, but number two, because she was now a follower of Christ. And her brother Lazarus was also on the hit list because a whole lot of folks became believers after Jesus raised them from the dead. In fact, the Pharisees, of which Simon the father was a Pharisee, the Pharisees wanted Lazarus dead. So the father would probably have had to co-sign that. And I wouldn't be surprised if they did get rid of him after they got rid of Jesus. What are you talking about, Brother Bill? Oh, John chapter 12. Let's take a look at it. John 12, 1. Do you find this interesting? Yeah. Does, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. John 12, 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now drop down to verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, that Jesus was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but also that they might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. So they were going to kill Lazarus because too many people were becoming believers because of the miracle of Lazarus. Stopping by the house. Stopping by Simon the Pharisee's house. Hey, is your son, I don't, I don't want to talk to you, Simon. Is your son Lazarus here? i got to see this guy for myself. So every time... Simon the Pharisee opened up the door thinking it was somebody for him. Where's your son Lazarus? The one that's following Jesus. Simon was a Pharisee who was also a leper that Jesus probably didn't heal because of his unbelief. 
Simon the Pharisee didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah or even a prophet. So it must have really blew his mind when God began to move in his family in such a powerful way. His wayward daughter Mary gets saved, cleans up her life and becomes a Christian. His son Judas becomes one of the twelve, an apostle, a disciple of Christ. His son Lazarus dies and Jesus raises him from the dead. He also becomes a believer and a follower of Christ and many others become believers because of his testimony. And his father, Simon the Pharisee, probably co-signed the idea of having him killed. Maybe there was even some jealousy that Jesus raised his son from the dead but didn't heal his leprosy. Maybe that was sticking in his crawl. He raised my son from the dead. You think he could have thrown me a bone over here and healed me of my leprosy? But why should he? If the fellow wasn't going to believe, why bother? This brings us to Judas Iscariot. And I'll just say this. When Jesus returned back to his hometown of Nazareth, it said he did not many miracles there. Why? Because of their unbelief. He could have done them, but he chose not to. Why should he do miracles if they didn't believe? Which might be the case with this Pharisee. This brings us to Judas Iscariot, who we are told was the son of Simon. Now notice what we are told in John 12 again. I'll try to pick it up where we haven't looked at it yet. Okay, verse 4, John 12, 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with me, with you, but me you have not always. Here in this passage of scripture, Judas flips out when he realized that Mary took this expensive ointment that is believed to have been a year's salary. She took this ointment and anointed Jesus with it. Judas, Judas causes a scene and says it's because the ointment could have been sold instead to help the poor. Then we are told that Judas didn't care, didn't give a flip about the poor, but was a thief and the unofficial treasurer of the group and held the bag where they kept their money and he was stealing from them. None of the other disciples knew it, but Jesus being omniscient, all-knowing, he knew what Judas was doing. Note the following. Judas had everyone fooled except Jesus. The other disciples must have elected him to be this important position of group treasurer. Now, the logical choice would have been Matthew, who was a, a, a wealthy tax collector. He handled money all the time. He should have been the treasurer. But I got the feeling that after he left his old life to follow Jesus, he washed his hand. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm done with that. I don't want to handle no money. But you're the logical choice. It doesn't matter. I'm going another way. I'm going God's way. Amen? Amen. He probably didn't want to have anything to do with handling money or being tempted in that way. So the position was given to Judas, who immediately began stealing from the bag. Judas had so fooled the other disciples that at the Last Supper, when Jesus said, one of y'all sitting here is going to betray me, no one said, I bet you it's Judas. I bet my last dollars. No one said that. They all said, Lord, is it I? Is it I? No one suspected Judas. <clears throat> Interesting side note, at the Last Supper, usually you sit with those you're closest to. Jesus had an inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. John was sitting next to Jesus on one side, and next to him was Peter. Because Peter leaned over and did like this to John, said, ask him, ask him who, who, who the one that's going to betray you. John was so close to Jesus that it said he could have leaned his head right on Jesus' chest and hurt, hurt his heartbeat. That's how close John was. But guess who was sitting on the other side? Judas is scared. He was right there, got that seat right next to Jesus. No one questioned it. So close to Jesus was Judas at the Last Supper that no one heard Jesus tell him in John 13, 27. That thou doest what you're getting ready to do, do quickly. Verse 28, 29. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake unto them. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. What, what, did, what did Jesus say to him? I don't know. He probably told him about the wall and get some coffee, get some rat coffee, get some, get some donuts while you're at it. They didn't know. Now I mention all that because it gives us some insight into the darkness of Judas's character. He was a thief. He was a liar. 
He had deceived the other disciples to trust him, then elect him to the important position of treasurer. What was he doing with the money that he was stealing? We're not told. I mean, they had a lot of offerings. People were giving them offerings all the time. Every time they looked in the bag, where'd all the money go? Maybe he was buying himself some extra food. They ate simple meals. Maybe he was going into town. Couldn't, hey, you got some crumbs on your lapel. It wasn't clothes. He didn't have a new hat or shoes because they were said, yo, where'd you get the money for that hat and shoes? So it couldn't be something they couldn't see. He didn't have a separate bag in his pocket that was G. would say, oh, what do you got in your pocket there? It wasn't that. I mean, was he visiting harlots? It had to be something where it couldn't be traced back to him, but that money was disappearing. Imagine how many times Judas must have told the other fellows, hey, fellas, Kitty's getting low. We're running low on cash here. Bag's almost empty. Pony up. And it was because he was stealing. They were probably wondering why they were always broke. But Jesus knew. And he never treated Judas any different. Even though he knew Judas was fixing to betray him. Which brings us to a second observation. As stated earlier, Judas threw a fit when Mary, who was possibly his sister, used that expensive ointment on Jesus. His actions revealed two things. He thought it was a waste of money to spend that ointment on Jesus. It shows you what he thought about Jesus. He should have considered that the most wonderful thing that he could do, anoint the feet of Jesus. He thought it was a waste of the ointment. And it reveals that there may have been more going on here. Again, if Judas was a part of this family, and Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were his brothers and sisters, Maybe the real reason why he was so upset, because I was wondering, why is he so upset? Why is he taking it so personally when I first read this? Maybe he considered this expensive ointment family business. Perhaps it was their life savings, their inheritance. And that's why he was so upset and seemed to take it personally, like he had a vested interest in the situation. Hey, wait a second, wait a second. We could have split that in four, four ways. I want my cut here. Well, what, what? Why was my consultant on that? That's a year's salary here. That'll set me up for life. Maybe that's why he was so upset. We can guess. We can make assumptions. We just don't know. But it does seem to make sense. But I can tell you this. Jesus didn't like the way Judas was talking to Mary. And he didn't like the fact that Judas was making a scene stirring up trouble. And on top of all that, Matthew 26, 8 seems to indicate that Judas was trying to stir the other disciples up. Because in that account, we are told, but when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? The other accounts only say that it was Judas, not them. But I, I think he went to say, hey, you see what's going on here? The bottom line is Jesus knew what Judas was up to, and he nipped it in the bud, and he stepped hard to Judas and publicly rebuked him in front of the other disciples and very possibly in front of his own family. Jesus flat out told him, knock it off. Leave her alone. That last statement, when he said about the poor, the poor you have with you always, it was almost like a, a backhanded slap in the face because Judas said that's why he wanted to spend the money for the poor. Jesus called him on it. The interesting thing about this passage of Scripture is that this particular incident set in motion Judas' plan to betray Jesus because right after this incident takes place, we are told this, and I'm done. I promise you I'm done. I just got to finish this out. Matthew 26, 8. Verse 14. Then one of the twelve called Judas after this incident went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he saw opportunity to betray him, right after the incident that took place here. I believe that Judas was extremely upset that Jesus had rebuked him, wounded his pride, affected his image, shamed him before family and friends, and he wanted revenge. And number two, Judas had his eyes on that ointment because it was expensive and would have brought in a lot of money that he was hoping to steal. When his plans for that money fell through, Judas went to plan B, which was to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He went out immediately to secure that money from the Pharisees. He, why? He was so desperate for that money, we'll never know till we get to heaven. But there it is. He said, well, what, what do we do now? I don't know. 
I guess I can close by saying this is the great thing about the Bible. I've been saved all these years and I just now found it. We can just study the Word and just find gold nuggets of truth like that. It doesn't have to be something earth shattering, but when you find some little truth like that, boy, it'll take you down the road. Yeah. Why don't we all stay?